Hello. In this video, we'll discuss the difference between a population and a sample. We'll also talk about how it can be difficult to create and recruit a representative sample. A population is defined as the total membership of a group that you want your data or study to represent. The population size can vary depending on what you're trying to study. If you want to know about the unemployment rate or annual income in the United States, your population would consist of every person in the U.S. Or maybe you just want to know the average hourly wage in the state of Georgia. Then your population would consist of all hourly wage workers in Georgia. That is a lot of people, so researchers rely on samples of the population instead. The population becomes a pool from which the sample is drawn. Samples are always smaller than the population, making them easier to handle than trying to study the entire population. Sampling is also helpful when it comes to big data. As mentioned in the previous video, it can take a lot of time, computing power, and storage space to process big data. So if you take a random and representative sample, then it can be run through the same algorithms or statistical analyses faster and more efficiently. Let's say you run a donut shop and want to ensure that all of the donuts you serve are of the best quality. You might take a random sample of all the donuts you make in a day and taste test them, ensuring you are selling great donuts to your customers. The picture on the left represents the population of donuts, while the four boxes on the right represent possible samples of the donuts. At the end of the day, you end up sampling these six donuts, and they were all delicious, meeting your high standards. You can feel confident that you are selling quality donuts to your customers, even though you didn't taste every single donut you made that day because uh, no one wants to buy a donut with a bite already taken out of it. Sampling people can be more difficult than sampling donuts. Let's say you want to know if the loved ones of students at a graduation ceremony enjoy the ceremony or wished it would have been run differently. Since there are far too many people at the graduation, you decide to take a sample. You select all the people in this section. Would that be a representative sample? Would the folks in that section have the same experiences as the folks in this section? Or this one? What about this one? What about the people under these stands here? How you select your sample is important because it will shape your data, which in turn will affect the results of your study. If you only survey folks in the highlighted section, you could be missing important insights from folks from other sections. Maybe the sound system wasn't working for one of the sections, and that greatly affected their experience. Or maybe they couldn't see the screen because of the glare of the sun. These are all important factors that might be concealed based on your sampling technique. For a truly representative sample, you would want to randomly select attendees of the graduation and then force them to take the survey. However, that is impractical and unreasonable, which is why true random sampling doesn't often occur when surveying people. A representative sample means the sample is representative of the population. Therefore, it will have similar characteristics as the population from which it's drawn. If you are studying humans, these characteristics are often demographic factors, such as age, race, class, location, gender, and education. Or going back to our donut quality control example, if you wanted to make inferences about all of the donuts being made in the shop, your taste test sample should reflect all of the different flavors the shop offers. Having a representative sample allows you to make predictions or gain inferences from the sample that can be applied to the population as a whole. For example, if 62% of folks from a representative sample of the United States indicated that they favor the legalization of marijuana, then it would be reasonable to predict that about 62% of the population as a whole also favors legalization. 
samples are more likely to be representative if probability sampling techniques were used, which we'll discuss a bit later in this video. Samples are also more likely to be representative if they have larger sample sizes compared to smaller sample sizes. Probability sampling is when the sampling methods involve the process of random selection. By random, we don't mean without purpose. The term random here is related to the chance of being selected for the sample. A researcher has to be deliberate in procuring their sample for it to be random. There are various probability sampling techniques. For example, back in the donut quality control study we went over earlier, I could decide that I will taste test every 20th donut that is made. That's known as systematic sampling. Random selection can be difficult to do in real world research, especially when the subjects of the sample are people. In those situations, non-probability sampling techniques are used. This can include voluntary sampling, which is probably our best choice for the graduation study. We could hand out a survey with the graduation programs and ask the guests to fill them out and drop them in a box while they're on their way out. However, voluntary sampling does have its downfalls, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There are many other non-probability sampling techniques, such as convenience sampling. Let's say I want to poll students about a possible change of the school colors. So I head to the student center where I see a group of students outside dancing. I then ask them to fill out my poll. These students have become a part of my sample because they were conveniently available. When studying small, niche, or stigmatized populations, it can be difficult to procure a sample. For example, if you wanted to study former drug addicts, it might be hard for you to locate people to participate in your study. However, if you do find someone who is willing to be in your study, and they refer someone else, and that person refers to other people, and so on, your sample can build up through a snowball of referrals. That's referred to as snowball sampling. There are common sample limitations and challenges. Over-reliance on volunteers for things like reviews or comment cards leads to folks who are either very passionate one way or the other leaving you comments or feedback. And so that means you're going to have feedback from those who are either really upset or really pleased. We also do not know what the people who do not participate in our samples are like. It also means that folks who have busy schedules and can't volunteer will be left out. We tend to see an overrepresentation of college students. A lot of research is conducted on college campuses, which means that college students make a convenient sample for many researchers. But since college students are not representative of what the rest of the population looks like, these studies are limited in what they can conclude. Minority groups are often underrepresented in sample data. If a group is small in numbers, the chance that they will make it into a sample decreases. With the increase in utilization of data collected online, we can end up making assumptions about people as a whole, forgetting that there are still many people who are missing from those data sets due to their access to the internet or not using certain apps. All of these challenges mean to be a good consumer of data, we must remember to take a moment to consider how and from whom data is collected.